Mm. Hey, Mike, <laughs> you ever heard of veterinary tapas? No. Sounds tasty, though. It does, doesn't it? Yeah. Should we get Lacey Pitcher on to tell us about it? Yeah. Good idea. Hi, I'm Mike Brampton. And my name is Julian Hope. Welcome to Veterinary Ramblings. We interrupt the show for an important announcement. Hi there, dedicated listeners. We just wanted to take a little time outside of the show as we've got something very exciting to share with you. We have exclusive Veterinary Ramblings merchandise available now, including T-shirts, mugs, posters and prints. Now, personally, I think my favourite is our T-shirt with a hilarious diagram of cat anatomy, yeah. which has been revised to include their sandpaper tongue and treat detecting ears. And essential for all veterinary students. If you would like to show your support for the show, head over to veterinaryramblings.com and select either the merch button for a one-off purchase through our T-Mill store or select become a patron. I'm sure you'll be absolutely chuffed to know that everything on our T-Mill store is fully sustainable, carbon neutral and shipped in plastic free packaging. By making a one-off purchase, you will help us to plant more trees, save water and reduce carbon emissions. If you want to further support us, become a Patreon and receive items you cannot get through one-off purchasing. A shout out on the show, an exclusive Veterinary Ramblings content. Every single purchase made will really help us keep on interviewing amazing guests. But if nothing else, we do appreciate you tuning in. Now. Now. On on with the the show. show. Hi. Our latest victim, Julian. How are you? We're excellent, thank you very much. I'm rather taken by your wallpaper. I love it. I was looking at that. It, it's sort of asymmetrical tiles, an exercise in tessellation. Yeah, I don't um, concentrate very well in like plain or boring spaces. I find it really difficult to concentrate. So, um, yeah, it helps for me. Right. Can I ask the difficult questions? Yes. Please can do. I ask? Can I ask the the difficult question, please? And it's probably <laughs> one of the fundamental questions of the of of veterinary ramblings nowadays. Oh no. Lacey Pitcher, what is your favourite bread? Oh, so so it's a sourdough sold at a specific bakery and it's got dates in it. It's incredible. It's oh, about, I feel strongly really. it's about carbs. I made a dried apricot sourdough last year, which was great. But a date one, that would be that would be very, very gooey, wouldn't it? It's incredible. Just yeah. so is it, good. Is it like a hot cross bun? Kind of. It just, yeah, it's amazing. It tastes really good with some decent cheese. But, I mean, everything tastes good with decent cheese. So. Absolutely. Now, what, what, do you, what do you mean by decent cheese? Do you have any decent cheese in there in South Wales? Carefully. Uh, so, I, um, I now live in the Cotswolds. Um, ah. I bought my... <laughs> this sounds awful. I'm a sensible professional person that's got my life together um but i came here for a day trip and walked past the cheese shop and decided to move here temporarily and then a few weeks later went out to buy bread and milk and bought my house um so i feel strongly (laughs) about (laughs) okay Um, you take cheese very seriously don't you i do i do i'm a it's got to be a hell yeah Mm. or no kind of person so yeah, now the Cotswolds, with the Cotswold Cheese Company on the doorstep, is dangerous. Sounds it. What, so what sort of cheeses do they do they do there? Literally everything. There's like a good garlic yarg. There's some decent... I didn't think Wensleydale could be decent. Sorry, Wensleydale fans. But it's amazing. Good one. Um, still a black bomber. You've got to have a black bomber cheese. If you're from Wales, you can't not have... Oh, black black bomber is fantastic. It's a sort of hyper mature cheddar, it's got a really coarsey texture, and it tastes it's almost painful to, to eat. It's so incredibly rich. Yeah, is it I, more for painful to share? I, I don't think I've had black bomber before. Oh, it's great. It comes in a in a black wax uh, covering. Right. Yarg Yarg's an interesting cheese. So do you know how Yarg got its name? No. It's this family in Cornwall that wanted to make cheese. They had this great idea of making a, a nettle rat 
uh, cheese, cream cheese, and they were trying to come up with a name for it that, that sounded Cornish, and most importantly sounded sort of old Cornish, as they've been going for hundreds of years, and they're, they're called the Grey family. And they just experimented and wrote their name down differently and then read it backwards and yarg. It's great that's backwards. In, that's amazing. <laughs> they make real good cheese. Are you telling the they truth? Make very good cheese. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm telling the truth as I heard it. I've never I've never bothered fact checking because fun facts like that aren't necessarily evidence-based. So uh, <laughs> there our, our listeners could can tell us if it's wrong or not. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> A fact no. that's not going to save or or, or, uh, or destroy anyone's life, except for the Grey family or the Yarg family, uh, is yeah, worth right. checking. Don't bother. Life's too short to check those sort of facts. You check dosages, uh, you, you check blood results, but you don't check whether Yarg is Grey backwards um, no. with regards to the cheese company. You're I've right. just looked at the Cotswold Cheese Company and a big shout out to them. They look great. It's amazing. It's basically mm. like like living in my village is what i imagine willy wonka meets the cotswolds is like so there's like <laughs> a bakery there's a fudge shop there's a cheese shop there's a gin distillery honestly it's not a bad place to end up by accident yes how did they you end up there um so i i'm one of those people that lived a really carefree free lifestyle so I've kind of ricocheted around the counties a bit so I left Wales at 21 and right. um, I had quit veterinary nurse training went to work in car insurance and really missed it so okay. I stuck a pin in a map called a locum agency and said can you find me a job as an auxiliary in Cranley which is a tiny village in um Surrey near Surrey, yeah. Field. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of how I've lived life since. So if I, I've you know come to a, an end of a job or um, just yeah a, a new chapter, I'm quite happy to move, start over. Um, and I'd come home from some travelling and just wanted something different. So yeah, came for a day trip. Okay, and stayed. Yeah. And now and bought a house. They're trying to double your cholesterol month on month. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm gonna I'm gonna stick a pin in a map. So how big's your map? Uh, just UK wide. Right. I mean I was I was kind of sensible. Um I didn't really have any ties at all, apart from a very, very large rescue dog and the inability to drive. So I suppose they're two fairly fundamental points to moving. Yeah. Um, but I think veterinary medicine is pretty amazing that, you know, our vet and nurse passports allow us a lot of opportunities that either we don't always see are there or, you know, aren't always available to the general public. And I was really lucky that vet nurses are needed and, I found an incredible practice who were just like, yeah, when when can you come? We're really short. We need some help. When mm. when can you come? And I said, oh, I can start Monday. Um, and they said, well, we've got accommodation. Um, I said, brilliant. Can I bring my dog? And they were like, yeah, no problem. What is she? Uh, she's a Mastiff Cross Great Dane. Um, and they were like, okay, no problem. Um, and they were amazing. Um, and once That's I found so scared of you it, setting the dog on them. Literally, <laughs> they don't say no, are they? <laughs> no, it's like having a small and, and he's stoked up on cheese already. <laughs> <laughs> I remember saying to them, but she folds up quite small. Um, Fold up. She's a travelling mastiff. <laughs> yeah, and it was just I found having having walked away from training, actually finding a really nice practice in a really lovely little village was really lovely values meant that I had missed veterinary medicine the entire time. I just hadn't necessarily been in the right space for me. Mm -hmm. um, within a few weeks of being an auxiliary at that practice, we reinstated my training and I signed a contract to stay as a member of the team and, and start my, my training again. Mm -hmm. um, and it just made so much of a difference. And you just think if I hadn't have taken that chance, 
I might mm -hmm. not have had the career I've had. So from there on out, really, if there's an opportunity or something that just feels worth exploring, I've always thought, well, what's what's the worst that can happen? Mm -hmm. Now I'm registered. There's so many opportunities. Mm -hmm. If I try something and it doesn't work or it's not for me, I can say, well, I've, I've had a go and do something else instead. So that's kind of the principle for everything since. Right. OK. Mm. Sounds like a good principle. What sort of stuff yeah. have you got up to then with this magical passport? Uh, so I've... Um, what have we done? So I've done quite a lot of locoming. I've worked in charity practice. I love out of hours. Um, I've worked in ICU, worked in different referral centres, different disciplines across referral, um, travelled uh, in 2018 after a really tricky spell with mental health. I decided that that year for everything that wasn't quite going to plan, um, I thought, you know what, sod it, I'm going to emigrate. I'm going to New Zealand. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to the other side of the world. I'm going to go to New Zealand. Okay. And um, I thought, yeah, great. And I think I put a picture of my living room, like a panoramic, and said, does anyone want to buy anything? Um, I don't need it. I'm emigrating. And I was completely fixed on I'm emigrating. I'm going to New Zealand. Right. And it was cheaper to buy a round the world ticket. Okay. So in my mind, I was like, right, okay, so things are happening that I don't perceive to be great in life mm -hmm. and it's not feeling wonderful anymore. So I'm going to add a stop. So every time something happens that's not great and it's not making me happy or, you know, life throws a curveball, I'm going to add a stop. Um, but it wasn't a great year. <laughs> and lots went very, very wrong and I didn't feel very good anymore mental health was pretty appalling but I was really well supported by the veterinary community and what happened um was pretty incredible so I did a stop for every time and then ended up using my veterinary passport to essentially wing it around the world I booked flights nothing else and I went around the world in 80 days with a 12 kilo backpack and nothing else just mm -hmm. some scrubs and <laughs> a lot of enthusiasm ready to have my final stop in New Zealand to interview at um, university there and to go and nurse there. Fortunate to be a registered veterinary nurse and to have that ability um, mm. and I went and worked in panda rehab uh, went and worked with orangutans, did some street dog work in Borneo, went so and got when you say panda rehab, sorry, that's oh, presumably pandas who for some reason have started smoking dope or uh, injecting <laughs> and, and they can't stop the habit. They, you know, oh, 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 <laughs> circles around my eyes. Oh. Yeah, I've, so, I've seen um, some of them. Yeah, well. Do, do the pandas sing, they tried to make me go to rehab and I said, no, no, no. I want to see this. <laughs> I think that'd be amazing. In the 81 days I was traveling with just flights only, I managed to get round, where did I go? Hong Kong, China, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, Malaysia, Borneo, Fiji, New Zealand, and back through LA. Um, yeah, just obviously with a proper mm. passport and a veterinary passport to kind of blag my way. So I'll do a day's work for some accommodation. Um, if I do some work here, could I get some flights to the next place? Um, I got stuck in and lost in one country and asked the veterinary community and someone came and picked me up. It's pretty incredible. What so I, I'm going to just ask this because I, I find it um, the whole thing is very fascinating. But yeah. A couple of times you mentioned, I think you mentioned first of all that, that you were supported by the veterinary community, and, and now you just said you, you asked the veterinary community. Um, in, in what way? How did you sort of Google local vets, or, or you knew um, people out there already? Or yeah. So 
I started in veterinary medicine when I was 17. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm now getting much older. But easy, I've been in veterinary medicine. Easy. Yeah, no, thing no, on no, VR no, about you that. Seen <laughs> nothing yet. Yeah. Easy. Um, but these kids these days, though, Julian. God, yeah. <laughs> With the snappers. Oh, you, that's very kind. Sure. Um, so having grown up kind of in veterinary medicine, it's I think people do they talk about five degrees or seven degrees of separation? I think yeah. in vet med it's more like two. Mm -hmm. Everyone knows someone that knows someone or has worked with someone. Um, so I've been really fortunate that while I've been working in locum in, I've made some incredible friends um, and worked in lots of practices. Um, locum is incredible for that. You just meet so many amazing people, and because you're locum in, you make the effort to speak to people to find out about them to actually make friendships because if I'm in different counties each week it can feel really really isolating so I made an effort in all the practices that I worked and especially working nights you have to make a concerted effort to speak to people because otherwise I'm going to see one vet and that's it um, mm. but while I wasn't having a great time personally and my mental health had been, as I said, pretty, pretty poor. Um, I set up an initiative and we started building an online community uh, because I it wasn't that I felt awful. I just didn't feel anything at all. Um, and while my mental health was poor, the thought that someone else might feel <laughs> nothing um, that to me was that was sad. I didn't. Are, I didn't, it didn't are you talking how about com compassion fatigue here? Um, it was a contributing factor. Okay. Mm. Um, and so the the community started building, and we set up an initiative um, called Veterinary Pet Forward. So I didn't necessarily care about me, but I cared that someone the other end of the country might also be feeling that no one saw them or they were having a rough time and no one recognized and so we, what we started doing is sending very um individual packages um curated for what people liked um anonymously to any members of the veterinary community so it didn't matter if they were vets nurses receptionists practice managers anybody and they arrived unannounced at practices across the country so that the recipient that opened them and received them felt seen and valued and appreciated. Okay. And because mm. they didn't know where the packages came from, they couldn't say thank you. So the idea was that they pay the kindness forward. And so all of a sudden this ripple effect across the country started happening and people were sending the way we kind of explain it is like a virtual hug or high five. Sometimes it's just mm -hmm. you've worked your butt off with a case and everything's gone really well and you just want someone to see that you you noticed it. And one of the surprising things that it, you know, I'd assumed it would be students that had felt unappreciated or unseen sometimes, but actually we got um, lots of nominations for people that were senior. Um, so practice managers and clinical directors whose teams didn't know how to say, oh, I see you, I appreciate you without it feeling condescending or, or false. And so this, this movement started rippling. And so Veterinary Pay It Forward grew substantially. And during the time that it was growing, I had essentially had a breakdown that most of the community didn't know about because... I was the very smiley person, quite extroverted, had a good job, everything looked good on the outside. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But as the community grew, people got to know me. And so when I started this huge trip, they were completely rooting for me uh -huh. because I'd been transparent thinking, well, I'm starting to feel better. And the thought that someone else somewhere might still be feeling nothing we need to talk about that. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. And so we did. And, you know, it's not going to change the world. 
but for some people in that moment of time mm -hmm. uh, it did so I was just blown away by the number of people who were like well you've helped with the logistics of, of this and now you know we want to do something to help you back so it would have been I think when I got uh, I got lost in New Zealand and I didn't have anywhere to stay that night um, so I'd messaged a friend to say I don't suppose you know anybody in mm -hmm. New Zealand just so I can work out the area just to almost calm myself and within an hour or two I got a text message saying oh if you can just get to this town someone will come and pick you up um, I've got friends at a vet practice they've asked their team someone will um, someone will come and help you and that's kind of a bit of a bolt out of the blue it just makes you go wow how many professions and careers could you know that actually would be there for you and there's just something really special about veterinary medicine mm -hmm. where we've got this big extended family who just kind of go I get it what can I do mm. how can I help what do you need um, and it's been amazing so I've kind of embraced it ever since because the connections we make are so important and we underappreciate them so often but I hadn't realized until I'd started traveling how many people would have been there the entire time and what? if I'd have said to someone I'm not okay would have been there they what just didn't platform know. is this on um so it's veterinary pay it forward we basically set up really really simply um very high tech I was just a woman with a dog and a notepad that I took everywhere and we ran through Facebook and right. people would message and say you know we've lost a patient today the clinician worked really really hard the vet worked really really hard and they're blaming themselves mm -hmm. they didn't do anything wrong but they just feel they must have missed something and right. I just want them to, to know they're appreciated and right. that we we saw that and so with their their details of the practice and the person's name they'd send some pointers so it could be something really obscure we had one lady that really loved Harry Potter mm -hmm. and so those those kind of notes go in the notebook and when someone wanted to do something nice for someone they'd just message and say can I have a name off the list so they might never have met this person at all and right. they just get some, some small details and then they would go out and they would personally curate this package to arrive for another person somewhere else in the country knowing that they were going to make their day and it just lifted the entire teams when they landed because no one knew they were coming um so it's really really simple but it just made such a difference to lots of people and was a huge huge shift for me I couldn't say I would still be here without the community that looked after me and that's mm. like I'm so lucky so so lucky I think we're at 5,000 parcels now wow. um, yeah 5, yeah amazing amazing um, and then yeah we've got a few thousand people in the group but people dip in and join and leave as they feel they want to um, and it's just, yeah, it, and I think it's really important that we don't differentiate between clinical and non-clinical mm -hmm. um, and all members of the team, whether you are vet nurse, clinical director, um, that uh, one of the most amazing parcels we ever sent went to um, a gentleman that works at the crematorium um, and he visited the team every week and he always checked if he noticed someone wasn't okay or was, wasn't their normal cheery self, he checked on the team and he got to know them because he'd been going there for a really long time. Right. And they messaged and said, oh, I know he's not a member of the veterinary team, but can we? Like he's, he, like, he won't let us carry anything that's too heavy and he always checks we're okay. Um, and that was lovely because I hadn't thought about it then, but who says thank you to those people? Who says thank you to... Um, yeah. And so it's been it's been amazing um 
but it kind of brings home and when you see some of the nominations that come through the compassion in our profession is huge absolutely, um, absolutely. i think there's no there's no question about that but i had no idea or concept that this this little community was existing on facebook or wherever reddit or instagram or or, or whatever so, yeah. so what, what's it called then on facebook uh, veterinary pay it forward veterinary veterinary pay it forward okay yeah <coughs> It's a, it's a closed group um, and that is partly because some of the content mm -hmm. understandably that comes through is sensitive um, mm -hmm. so we have had some fairly triggering content most of that is is kept um, messages which is why I keep everything very very tight in terms of who has any information and it means that I can then filter what is said mm -hmm. if someone is going to let me know that they, you know, the person involved is having some really serious um, problems in life, then that information is kept mm -hmm. uh, with me. And the person wanting to gift is only given small amounts of information just to keep everyone safe mm -hmm. and comfortable. That's not my information to share. Mm -hmm. um, but we've got, a, we've got a public facing page as well where occasionally if there's something happening in the veterinary community that's really affecting us, we can put something out that will help the public understand um, where we are. So for example, there is a post that gets regurgitated every year about euthanasia of pets mm -hmm. and owners mm -hmm. not school. Um, and it's one that really impacts people a lot. Um, it talks about that the pet looking for people and mm -hmm. and actually I found that really traumatic to read and that's partly because we all deal with grief completely differently mm -hmm. and the thought that a family or care or pet advocate might read that having just put their own pet to sleep mm -hmm. and how that would affect their grief and how mm -hmm. they would feel judged was just awful. It just really affected me because I just thought, well, some of the most precious euthanasias that I could, you know, I really remember and have really impacted my career and shaped how actually I do things now mm -hmm. were not with the family present at all. Mm -hmm. So we used the public facing page to almost write a, a reply and a just a different take mm -hmm. on a similar thing. Um, and I think that that covered millions of people. Uh, it's been opened all around the world. And it was just a chance as a community to kind of explain mm -hmm. what actually happens um, in a way that is less traumatic for the public, but also far more empathetic to the profession and for the families that are going through things. So it reappears every now and again, and I'll see someone share it. And I just think actually, we we did that um and I, mm -hmm. I just think if that if that helps someone deal with their grief in a more constructive way with more signposting than making them feel ashamed that's far nicer for everybody and yeah. if every word of the reply was true it's just a nicer thing to read um rather than clickbait for clickbait's sake mm -hmm. I think you, you mentioned um, uh, better to do that than make them feel ashamed. And I know that that's very, uh, very much at the heart of what you believe and what you do. And I, I'm going to move you on to, if, if Mike doesn't mind, on to Brachis Phallix now, because you, uh, you, you said quite rightly in your email to us that you'd much rather be an advocate for Brachis Phallix than to push people away who might otherwise need it or seek veterinary assistance. With their dogs yeah i um i've come under fire quite a lot for my thoughts and feelings and discussions on brachis phallics and i understand the topic is like marmite i completely understand and appreciate that you know people feel very strongly and i 100 percent agree my concern comes with the idea that they're already here 
So extreme mm. confirmation is already here. If I were to, I don't have children. I noticed you looked at Mike in particular when he said that. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, if, or was if, it, oh no, it was me. It was me. It's reverse. Was, oh no. Okay. <laughs> Um, I think if if I had a child and I took them to nursery and someone said they're ugly, I am not going to go back to that nursery. And they might be the mm -hmm. best nursery in the country with the best reports and the best everything and be offering it to me for free. But I don't trust them. And I will lose respect mm -hmm. for them very, very quickly because I'm upset and I'm offended and probably a bit embarrassed. My child might be ugly, but they're mine. Um, and I just feel that with extreme confirmation, we catch more bees with honey. I have felt quite strongly about brachys phallics for a very, very long time, but I couldn't understand why no one was talking to each other. Why breeders and vets and rescues and owners, why are we all wanting the same thing to have healthier pets but we're all pulling in completely different directions and everyone's arguing about the other party saying well you're wrong well you're wrong too i don't trust you mm -hmm. right? so I, I, think, I i think that's certainly true for responsible breeders but as we've seen yeah. over, over the last couple of years there are some very irresponsible ones producing dogs that, that really really struggle to stay alive horrendous mm -hmm. if i have to the word nose rope makes me twitch um so I joined a rescue and, and tried to understand why the communication, why is the communication problem happening? Why, why does no one trust each other? And I found that the biggest thing was, it was communication right from the off. So I thought, well, I can't change the world. This is a massive problem. And this is going back seven or eight years. And mm -hmm. things are much, mm -hmm. much worse now. Um, so I thought, well, if I can't do anything, if I can't do anything, to change the world what if i could stop one breeder breeding because they've chosen not to not because they've been told they're bad people because they've made an informed decision that this is not the one so this bulldog has a particularly flat face this cavalier has a very domed head and to look for so if i can try and educate people as to what they're looking for and how to breed responsibly and why to breed responsibly, then I might stand more of a chance of stopping bad breeders breeding. And if those breeders then go to their friends at a show and say, you know what, I had a really great conversation. Um, we've just done some health testing and it was just a simple blood test that I sent away. And I know my dog is clear for this, this and this. It actually wasn't very expensive. And I know that I'm doing the best I can to look after them wouldn't that be nicer? And it meant that we then started having clients coming in saying, I want to buy a puppy. Okay, what breed do you want to buy? That's not suitable for your lifestyle. Have you considered this, this and this? Oh no, I've not. And those conversations meant that the right dogs were then being chosen for the right homes and the breeders felt more empowered to say no to the wrong fit homes and everyone worked together a bit better but I was living in a very small community. Mm -hmm. And the more I worked with rescue, the more I saw some seriously awful health problems. And the more I started seeing what we've now in the last few years coined as vet bashing. And where people kind of are very derogatory about the veterinary profession. And the whole idea to me is, is sad that that trust relationship has broken down I remember my nan breeding when I was little and she had a great relationship with her vet mm -hmm. she had a brilliant and she had you know they she talked about them with I mean I remember it now she talked about them with such enthusiasm mm -hmm. and I just think we want you know people talk about James Herriot times and that's fantastic but medicine is changing and has moved and we now know that there's so much genetic testing and everything that can be done to improve things how do we get back that relationship because once the relationship's there people talk so if I can encourage people 
to seek out education rather than alienation. I just feel the welfare crisis is already here. Saying brachycephalix is bad is just going to put, push people into forums that are unregulated with poor information of anecdotes of someone that's had dogs for 30 years with no science and greater impact the poor breeding of poorly bred dogs and the the problem just compounds so I still am heavily involved with rescues um, although I say brachycephalic I mean bulldog I do get frustrated when people say brachycephalics but actually mean bulldogs because there's still lots of people that are not bulldog fans which I understand but will say brachycephalic and I think well you own a shih tzu that's brachycephalic <laughs> um, I think we forget quite often that there are lots and lots of brachycephalic breeds boxes are getting shorter and shorter in the muzzle than I've ever seen mm. and it's really mm. and there's brachy creep and things like Newfoundlands that's just awful it it's, it's difficult, isn't it? And people really want to have that, that sort of almost two-dimensional face that looks mm. semi-humanoid uh, in a, yeah. a weird, cartoony way. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it's difficult, isn't it, though? Because with, with, with owners, by and large, the breeders that, that, that we have at the practice, great. Um, even the brachycephalic breeders, he laughed. Um, mm -hmm. But more often than not, clients will come in with a dog they've already got. Mm. Yeah. And if there's a brachycephalic that needs surgery, it's very difficult to, to point out the good things about the dog. You can, you can know how cute it is, how sweet yeah. it is, but by the way, it can't breathe or stand. Uh, <laughs> yeah. and, and, and sooner or later in the conversation, it comes around to the fact that it's quite obvious the client has bought a dog that isn't suitable for life. Yes. Uh, and and you're absolutely right. You can't make the client feel bad about that because you no. lose them. You then lose that dog and they probably will never get any surgery done. They'll completely mistrust vets forever. Yeah. It's a fine balance though, isn't it? Because you, yeah. you can't extol the virtues of it and then talk about how shit it is. <laughs> no, no. But if I can have a conversation with them so that that dog in front of me has the best chance at the most comfortable life that that dog can attain, yeah. I will have done something to improve its welfare. If it leaves that clinic feeling ashamed, embarrassed, hurt, really hurt, they're never going to come back. And so that dog who's probably got very short buckling legs, it's going to be arthritic, painful with its skin, have horrific ears, be worried about being touched because it's in so much pain, that's going to have a really negative impact yeah. on its welfare if i can educate them enough to keep that dog comfy and moreover them not go and buy another one yeah so maybe if collectively we started looking in a different way at how we help these dogs rather than just saying ban them they're already here if we could just make life more comfortable for them and stop people breeding from them then we might stand half a chance. It's going to take a really long time. It's very easy to damage a breed. It takes a long time to fix it. And it's not going to be done in my lifetime. I'm realistic. It's not going to be done in my lifetime with bulldogs particularly. It just won't. But we can have a good go and we can try to shift things. You know, there are more people now sat in those rescues that aren't going and buying puppies and if they're yeah. ended up in rescue chances are those homes that are being vetted know what they're taking on they're being educated before those dogs are are adopted and the shift is happening it it's just slow and it feels monotonous i, I can't help feeling over the last few years i mean when i first started off there were so many different breeds of dogs i saw every day and I describe most days now as seeing a combination of flat-faced dogs and biscuit-coloured dogs. <laughs> yes. You, know, you get the feeling that, that we're no longer in a, uh, a world of canine diversity, whereas we are very much in a world of human diversity, aren't we? And uh, yeah. I know we're going to move on if we could now to another of your passions, which is uh, uh, neurodiversity. Yes. Do you want to tell us what that is? Yeah. Um, so 
neurodiversity is essentially the understanding that our brains are wired differently. So you can have neurotypical brains, so the standard brain, if you like, and then in the population, much like all biodiversity, there are people whose brains are just wired differently, different, not less. Mm -hmm. And so neurodiversity is the term that describes that, that brains can be different. Um, and in that kind of um, umbrella term are some of the terms, labels, whichever you like, that used to have sadly, really negative connotation. So one of the most common ones that lots of people will, will know is dyslexia. Well, I was at school, and it's really sad to think about now, if you were dyslexic, it was deemed that you, you just weren't very bright, you weren't very clever. And that, that was sadly the connotations that most people had. Mm -hmm. um, I did well at school. I was in our top set, so I, I did reasonably well. And it was mine wasn't picked up. So for transparency, I would say I'm neurodivergent um, and I have some neurodivergent traits. And because I was in top sets and I did well, and I was in the valleys, which was underfunded, um, it wasn't recognized. Now, mm -hmm. in later life, looking back, it was always there. There were just some intricacies that people just didn't pick up on. Um, so, for example, I didn't like reading out loud in class. And it was just Lacey doesn't like reading out loud in class, even though I'm in a top set doing reasonably well. And then when we looked at my GCSE results, I was in top sets for English language and literature. My literature came out an A star, my language a C. And it wasn't mm -hmm. ability. I just hadn't been set up to succeed. The system was not built for me. Mm -hmm. And so the easiest way that I now have to explain to people how it feels is that the majority of the people in my world have an Apple phone. I've got an Android and no one gave me the manual. So I've got to find out how to work what I've got while trying to copy everybody else. It's like speaking a different language. My neurodiversity hasn't been explored fully until adult life so I've gone through all my childhood and all of my nurse training not knowing so I didn't know why I found things hard and it's actually been it's incredibly difficult so I don't want to speak for anybody else I can only speak for me but the constant having to mask lots of my neurodiverse traits is actually exhausting and it's only now that we've started looking into things that I realize that because I've never known any different having gone through some, some diagnostics and different things we realize that I've actually got ADHD so I will leave lots of things till last minute and if everything is given to me at the same time I will still do that there's now um, some really amazing research that looks at burnout rates mm -hmm. and with neurodiversity because you're using so much extra energy just to mask the traits that are normal to you to mimic what the rest of society are doing and lots of people do not know that their brain is wired differently because you've only got the one that you live with mm -hmm. so it's really difficult if you think well I've always done things this way this is this is how I've always thought and felt so I now speak about neurodiversity more so so that the people that aren't there yet don't feel on their own um, and appreciate that actually there are some things I will excel with and I just utilise the way my brain is wired. If we allow people to utilise the way their brain is wired, how much more could we get out of them? How much more could we do? Mm. Lots of the innovators in society are or were neurodivergent but I'm quite open and honest when people ask how or why or what's preferred um, with people because actually there are some incredible people now in in areas that I work so I work for Vets Diego Diversify 
we kind of run an online community looking at how people can find their fit within the veterinary profession and wider networks. And they were one of the first companies that I've worked for that said, how do you need us to communicate with you? Mm-hmm. What, what do you want? Mm-hmm. So now, if they need something from me, they know to email me in bullet points. If they send me a paragraph, I probably won't read it. It'll go to the bottom of the to-do list. If they send me bullet points, it's back, done, actioned within half an hour. <laughs> I, I like bullet points, though. I, like I think it. you've done very well with yeah. our um, <laughs> with your, yeah. our introduction to uh, to veterinary ramblings. For those who don't know, when uh, when guests are preparing to come on the show, and we're preparing to have guests on the show, we send pages and pages of stuff. But bullet points. Good point, a, Lacey. You use a font that is dyslexia friendly. The layout of your document is easy to look at and the colours are suitable because I'm, I don't see, I see in colour, mm-hmm. I don't see in black and white. And because it's surrounded by colour, I can read it. Whereas normally I have to take every document that's sent to me, I have to highlight them and change all the colours so that I can read it. Mm-hmm. It's not in a format I can read, okay. which is scary, isn't it? When you think what colour are consent forms? They're all in black and white, stark black and white. They are. So how many people, when we're at gaining informed consent, can really read it? And how many people say they can read it for fear of seeming like they're not clever? A very good point. Yes, it is an incredibly good point. And and, um, that would open a whole new kettle of fish, wouldn't it, about uh, consent, Mm -hmm. informed consent or not? Mm -hmm. So, so, Lacey, you like breaking things down into, into smaller pieces then? Mm-hmm. Which, which yeah. bring, brings me on to uh, <laughs> have you have you have you listened to uh, veterinary ramblings or uh, have you seen any veterinary ramblings before i have i've just listened to craig tessimans okay oh yeah 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 it was very okay. good good old craig so, so in that like, case then, like craig. The, the question for you is how did you come across 60 second cpd i did you did okay so how do you fancy taking our 60 second CPD challenge, Lacey? I can give it a go. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. What, what do you want to talk about? Um, let's stick with neurodiversity and okay. we can look at maybe some of the things that we can do to help each other. Okay, right. Mm-hmm. So in that case, then let me get let me get the magic clock working. So 60 second CPD by Lacey Pitcher who's going to talk about neurodiversity and how we can help each other starting now. So neurodiversity is the understanding that brains are wired differently. And it's really important that we are all mindful that it's different, not less. Now, I've only been born with the brain I've got. um, And so I don't know how a neurotypical brain works either. So I think one of the most important things when we talk about neurodiversity is to actually have open conversations with curiosity and to meet each other and ask how people want to be communicated with. Some people will prefer things like voice notes. It's much easier to understand the tone of something. Whereas if I get a sharp email, I spend a lot of time worrying that I have upset or offended people. And this is really important when we think about our clients, our teams and wider networks. So if we can start asking each other how we want to be communicated with, this is not a conversation about neurodiversity. It's just a conversation about bespoke people. Wow. Perfect. Absolutely perfect timing. Well done. That was was great. That was was, was awesome. That was awesome, Lacey. Brilliant. And I think you prepared that. so quickly, doesn't it? Yeah, it does, doesn't it? It does. And and I think you prepared that 15 minutes ago. (laughs) <laughs> you mentioned a few times about um, uh, do, do clients understand us or, or the communication really isn't it? the communication mm-hmm. between us mm. us and clients us and them uh, and I, I always say to to new grads when I'm mentoring them that actually do, don't judge a client you know, either on the first site or on the first visit at all because actually they might have had a really crappy day they might be coming from uh, from a car crash they might have just discovered that that 
they or a friend has some hideous disease or they've got no money left for the end of the month or they're, they're just plain worried about their pet. Yeah. And they might be snappish. They might appear brusque or, or uncaring. And, and it's very, very easy for us to think, well, I don't like their attitude. And, and that's then this divide. That's yeah. then this, this, this mm-hmm. wall that we put up. Uh, I had a client today that uh, came in. She'd been annoyed about something after half an hour for her to leave the consulting room happy. Yeah. Her questions, her worries have been answered. And that that pleased me more than any of the surgery I've done today, any of the cases that, 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 that have come out well. Just that thought that I, I persevered. I thought there was some good in her and she was happy and a nice person at the end of it. I was really chuffed to bits about that. Hmm. I should think you would. I hope you charged for a half an hour consult. Bloody did. 40 minutes to charge for. Put the bastard surcharge on. Sorry, no, no, I, no, I, I, no, that, that was wrong. I shouldn't have said that. that <laughs> I hope you did. So tell me that. <laughs> tell me, Julian. Mm-hmm. Lacey's delivered a cracking 60 second CPD. She has, she has, yeah. yeah. Have, you got, have you got a certificate? Oh, let me have a look. I have. Okay. That's a, that's a bit of luck, isn't it? There we go. So it says, it says Certificate of Diversity. This, <laughs> this certifies that we're all different except me. And it says, if you have to, if you have to pay, pay it forward. So what have we got? We've got, we got presents on there, little wrapped presents. They're the gifts you give. And you mentioned Harry Potter. So yeah. uh, there's, there's some Harry Potter. Uh, they're the models. We went to Harry Potter World or wherever it is. And uh, there are these little models there of the, uh, uh, the, the goblins and things. There's some cheese, nice cheese selection. Uh, that's just, uh, that, that's, that's my fridge. So there's my own fridge. I always label the cheese I've got, make it look a bit like a cheese shop. Uh, <laughs> ne- never, never fewer than 30 different types of cheese. Um, what's that? Travelling, you mentioned travel. So there's a travelling place. That's a travelling place in mountains. And, and here are two divergent noses. Here's at the top, there's a, a Labrador nose. Uh, not wanting to be at all biased, but I'd say a perfect nose for a dog. And oh. this is <laughs> just I'd say it. And and this is this is a brachycephalic dog, which isn't perfect. It isn't perfect. No, the, I love the your name in the background. I've just spotted it. Oh, <laughs> fantastic! There we go. Well, uh, yeah, you can probably about, screen grab that and then translated it. Yeah, I did. I got that. <laughs> I got that. <laughs> so this, this poor little dog can't see. It's got nasal folds that cover its eyes. Um, it has, you can probably, I don't know if you can see it or not, this is actually post-surgery for the nostrils, um, so I could get it to breathe again. Uh, and, and that's why it's got a nice pink tongue. Before it came into the practice, it was doing the same thing, but the tongue was blue. But there, oh, so that's... So that's the thing. They look like Voldemort at that stage, don't they? they <laughs> that's, that's why I put them opposite the uh, Harry Potter <laughs> <Yeah. stuff. laughs> <laughs> that's brilliant so, stuff. so there's your certificate and thank you very thank much you. for delivering the cpd for it yeah thank you so much that was really rather good you mentioned earlier on uh lacy about vets stay go diversify yes now what exactly is that um so vets stay go diversify also for nurses um basically looks at what you can do with your qualification. So there are so many people who have their veterinary qualification and then go, I'm, I'm done with it. And actually the community, so Vets Day Good Versify, founded by Ebony Escalona, who is now an incredibly good friend, um, thought, well, if all these people are really unhappy, isn't there a better way? What if all of these skills that they've got as veterinary professionals could be utilized in another way. If they're not happy and they don't wanna be in practice anymore, if they want to go, why not find them a job where they can use all those transferable skills? And then at least when they Mm -hmm. go to a different career, they could use what they've already got and, and enrich other professions with all of the skills that vet school or nursing school teaches you. Or what if we could diversify, so still be in the veterinary sector, but actually do something different. So, for example, you could have, you know, had dreams of being a small animal clinician and then you start and you're like, this is not for me. And you decide to go and work at the APHA or you go and lecture 
or so you could diversify, not because that's what they feel they have to. We want people to stay in this profession mm -hmm. because they want to be here and to feel fulfilled or that they're growing or whatever it needs to be for them. And that looks so different for each and every person. So for example, if someone says, well, I want to work in conservation, but I've no idea how to get there. You say, oh, we spoke to someone that's working in conservation. Let us introduce you. You can have a chat and see how they did it. Oh, actually there's someone that's just moved to Bermuda. They're working doing this. Why don't you have a conversation with them? So all these people can tell mm -hmm. their story almost to help someone else create their own roadmap for what they want their career to look like. I've just had a really evil thought. Oh. Dare yeah. I voice it? <laughs> this, isn't, this isn't a subplot. Go on, the, go on. This is a subplot by the RCVS to keep people paying their registration fees. <laughs> <laughs> so for conflict of interest, um, I do work for the RCVS in a different role. Um, <laughs> but I am so there we go. There we go. <laughs> so, um, but I love, I absolutely love clinical practice. Um, I still work out of hours. Um, I'm really lucky. I still am very much in love with veterinary medicine. But a job came up just on a night shift. And it's only having spoken in, in Vet State Diversify that I realised that we can do more than one thing. You're not defined by a one job role. And so I like to call it a veterinary tapas because um, I like to do bits of everything now. And so I work, <laughs> I work for Mind Matters um, because having gone through my own challenges um, and my own mental health battles, um, I have grown up in this profession and I want to help give something back if I can having known what it's like to be in practice mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. so not on the um fees front but now I yeah I spread my time between mind matters let's do good best by locoming and some referral work um because I'm greedy and I like tapas um <laughs> <laughs> do you want to tell us briefly about the My Matters initiative, MMI, that uh, the RCVS set up. So I know on, on, on Veterinary Roundings, we've spoken many times about uh, stress, depression, uh, and, and, and mind problems, mental health problems in the, in the profession. Yeah, yeah, I'm not, I'm never going to pretend that there aren't problems, you know, not just in the profession. We do talk about it in the profession a lot, but in wider societies. I've just finished reading... Joe Trissini's book and if you've not read it it's brilliant um he's the gentleman that's done uh some dancing videos and he gives all the dance moves different names if you've not seen it this is going to sound very odd yeah <laughs> but I'm what's sorry. the name Joe Joe Trissini Joe Trissini yeah he's okay. honestly uh so he's a, a gentleman that's got BPD um and speaks about mental health and um suicide openly in his in his very interesting way so it is a wider society conversation but obviously in veterinary medicine we have um more specific conversations now mind matters is um kind of a hub and an initiative in as part of the rcbs um and we look to protect prevent and uh, educate as well so provide training and support for the profession so we have kind of campfire conversations about some key areas that the profession want to talk about so for example there's some ones coming up this autumn on uh, social media and mental health and the impact of that and we'll have panelists from across the professions and wider network mm -hmm. um, they're not filmed or anything it's just a chance for the the professions to kind of come forward and and talk to each other and explore um, the topics so um growing up in south wales uh, rural community is really really important to me and where i live now we have lost too many people in the rural sector um, and veterinary sector to suicide um, and so 
uh, MMI recently funded um, mental health first data training for the rural network. And while that is to support the veterinary profession, it's also bearing in mind that the veterinary profession have a very, very unique um, and important bonds with the rural community. And for many farmers, the rural vets might be the only people they are seeing and who really connect and understand the situation some of them are in. And so we wanted to support the rural vets that are quite often having to have some, some really careful conversations with the rural community to give them some of the skills to help um, signpost and start those conversations. And so that was all um, funded by MMI. Um, and it's just phase one, hoping to build on it so that we can mm -hmm. try to support um, the rural network and, and many others across the industry as well, um, so that people can get the help that they need, but also to be able to support each other we have a pretty, as I said, amazing profession that are really empathetic and compassionate, but that's hard. It takes a lot of energy and we look after each other, but that means that when one of our team are impacted, that impacts us and it ripples across the profession. So we want to try and help support and protect the professions as well. Um, so I'm really, really proud really proud of the work we do you sound like you do an awful lot of reflection yeah <laughs> well here you go this is a corny link for that one then isn't it <laughs> <laughs> I, I think would you would you be kind enough <laughs> to sign out and close the show to leave everybody with a reflection question just to leave them with something to think about and then we'll do the normal close out and uh, hope that everybody's enjoyed the show. Click like, share, and don't forget to subscribe because it really does help. And uh, you can pick up Veterinary Ramblings off any of the main platforms. Lacey, do you have a reflection question for us? Yes, I would say it's... Hmm, my question would be, how can we help each other best? What can I do to help and where can we start the conversation so i'm passionate about neurodiversity mm -hmm. but that um looks at lots of different brains neurotypical and neurodivergent and so i would ask people to reflect on maybe how we can start helping each other more and communicating better um so how can we invite people in to understand what we need better well wow. yeah fantastic Lacey Pitcher. Food for thought. Food for thought, indeed. Thank you very, very much indeed. It's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you. And I think all it remains for us to do is to raise a cup or a glass and uh, wish you, may your dog go with you. Hey, look at that, we've <laughs> all got ceramics go tonight. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> I, I find it best to hide the rum in my ceramic <laughs> mug because then you think I'm drinking coffee, don't you? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Lacey Pitcher, may your dog go with you. Thank may you. Go with you. Lacey, Lacey, thank you so much. What a, what a great contribution you've, you've given us tonight for the show and, and uh, what a tremendous journey you're on. Thank you for letting us be part of it. Thank you so, so much for having me. It's been lovely to chat. You're very welcome.